let me take you back to 10th of, of December 1919 to All Saints Church. Anybody um, who knows Worcester, that's at the, the, the top of Bridge Street um, and, on, 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 and on Dean's Way. And on this evening, the Reverend John McRae, who's there pictured, and 23 other people met. It was a year and a month after the armistice. And the question was, what were they going to do to remember the men of the parish who had died during the war? They, what they came together to look at the provision of a war memorial for all saints. Uh, the Reverend McRae started off by giving particulars of some of the men who'd served and died. And he opened a conversation about what should they do. Now, John McRae himself had uh, served during the war as a, as a chaplain. He was out there, we think, about a year, um, served very close to the front line and mucked in with his men, um, took his, his, his role on, um, we know from a letter, from um, helping to cook food uh, on, on that particular rotor, uh, supported the men in whatever way he could, conducted services. Uh, the records from the uh, Royal Army Chaplaincy uh, describe John McCrea as a large man with a strong personality. Um, and he suggested that a fund should be raised for creating a memorial and everybody who wanted to should be given the opportunity to contribute towards that memorial, which should be for everyone who had died uh, during the war in the parish. What should they do? What should they have? Um, one suggestion was a lamp uh, con constantly burning to, um, in honour of the undying spirit of the men who died. Other people suggested a cross outside the, the church with, with the men's name on. Um, other people said a stained glass window or a panel inside the church. It was agreed to have another meeting at which they would discuss this further and have the opportunity to reflect. Um, the All Saints War Memorial in some ways is just one example of thousands and thousands across the country that sprang up. For most, we have very little idea about how they were created, maybe just hints here and there. Um, quite a few years ago, I started compiling details of the men who were listed on the All Saints War Memorial. And then a few years ago, I came across in the archives the War Memorial Committee Minutes which were compiled, which recorded the story of how the memorial was created, how they went around doing it. Now, this is actually quite unusual. I've spoken to a few other people who've researched war memorials and very, very few other ones survive. So this is um, a very rare insight into the story, how they went around creating it. How did they go around doing it? Now, it was made up the committee of local people, many of whom had connections to people who, were, who had died and would later be recorded on the memorials. For instance, the mother of Herbert Watkins attended the meeting. Um, Herbert and, uh, lived with his mother on, on the butts, just a stone's throw from, from the hive. He served in the Worcestershire Yeomanry and he went out to Egypt in April 1915 and he was there a year before he died as a prisoner of war in Damascus. And so his mother uh, came along and seeking to ensure that he and the other people of the local area would be recorded. So if this was a talk in person, I would have an open question and say, what is a parish? Um, and, and you can get various answers. And some of these are, um, are because there are different definitions sometimes of, of parish, how it's seen. There is the ecclesiastical nature um, of the Church of England. Everywhere in the country is included within a parish. But also... Um, it's, it's as, it, as everywhere in the country is included with, um, within a parish, it's also used for all sorts of other purposes and it has, has a wider uh, reach as well. And so 
people are considered parishioners, even if you never go into a church, it's considered everybody in that area and it fulfills that role. And certainly the Reverend McCrae was keen that a memorial should be outside if possible. So everyone in the in the parish feels it, that it, it's theirs. Now, there's a map um, on the screen. It's a little bit harder to read rather than if I'd been in somewhere and I can, can blow it up, but showing the All Saints Parish. And it goes from what would be today the, the Hive, um, going southwards through the bus station down to All Saints Church itself and eastwards across to um, Angel Square um, and including parts of, of Broad Street. It's a compoundedly small area considering what you think of today because there's so many other parishes in that area. And I plotted out the men on the memorial and, and any addresses that are mentioned and about half of them are within the, uh, the, the parish, the other half aren't, because there'd also be other people who might be in the choir, uh, they might have had other connections, been baptised or married there, their parents might have been connected, they may have moved, or had some sort of connection that meant that they were included on the All Saints War Memorial, as well as those people who, who lived uh, in, in the parish. And the parish of All Saints was probably quite a small one. Uh, Dalton and Newport Street, which uh, the houses later demolished, were quite poor. And some of the photographs, these ones in the 1930s, give an indication of that. And some of the other comments indicate that, uh, that the people there were quite poor and it was quite an impoverished area. As some of the photographs show, some of these are when they'd started to demolish certain buildings. Other ones were not demolished until the 1960s, and it still had a little bit of a reputation of people wanting to avoid uh, these streets. And this is a court on Newport Street. A court is where you have a courtyard around which are quite a few houses. Sometimes they would be sharing toilets and other facilities, quite cramped, often quite damp. And later on, in the 1960s, they were demolished because they were unfit for, for human habitation. And this is uh, makes up part of the parish of All Saints. So some people lived there, other people had other connections. A uh, private James Dears of the, uh, joined the Royal Warwickshire Regiment, and he lived on Rack Alley in the Butt. His parents had lived there as well, and um, he enlisted when he, when he sorry when he enlisted. He put him his, his uh, address and um, where he was born as All Saints Parish Worcester. Um, he died on the 1st of August 1916, a year and a day after he arrived in France. Um, he was married to Joy and they had been married at All Saints Church on the 26th of July 1913. Today, war memorials are a relatively common sight. Just a month ago we had Remembrance Day. Uh, this year was obviously quite different um, as everything had to be socially distanced. But there are numerous um, services and uh, where wreaths are laid and people mark it um, either individually or, or as groups. But it's easy to forget that at the end of the First World War, these were quite unusual. There'd been some general war memorials at the end of the Boer War, about uh, 15 years earlier, for instance, outside um, the Worcester Cathedral. But before that, memorials were normally just to individuals and normally just to officers. But with the, the, the scale of, of the men who died, um, local communities wanted to mark this, particularly as the bodies were not repatriated unless people had died in this country after being being wounded. So it's case of what do we do? And there's definitely a sense of, of everybody around the country grappling, how do we do this? What do we do? And hence, there's all sorts of different ways that it's marked in some war memorials. There are so many different styles. The cenotaph, that is considered to be a really important memorial. Um, and it is so important to many, many people. It was actually quite controversial in 1919 when it was first erected and a number, a number of uh, key people didn't like it and, and wanted the design replaced. It was only a temporary structure at first for the Peace Day in 1919, but it, it hit a chord with people. So many people came and paid their respects and indicated that how important it was to them that it stayed. They, they created a permanent version and now that is the focus of the um, of the British 
uh, Remembrance Sunday commemorations and people couldn't imagine uh, Remembrance Sunday, I'm sure, without that. But everywhere had, you know, had to work out what did they do locally? What would they do? And so another meeting took place uh, a week or two after the original one at All Saints at the Waterman's Hall in Dolday, just round the corner. And that's here, more people came along and they discussed plans. Somebody had suggested a, a memorial outside and then one inside, but apparently that would have, the one in, indoors was far more expensive than they thought. Um, some people suggested a Calvary, others a cenotaph, uh, a memorial cross, um, and various other options were suggested. Eventually they decided on a cross outside the church and then at the end of January 1920, Major Rowe, uh, who worked for a firm of architects, gave two designs of a Saxon cross, what we probably would call a Celtic cross today, with or without a sword. And it was voted on by a show of hands which option to go for, and they decided then to proceed. After I read this, um, I, I seem to be seeing war memorials in this shape everywhere I looked. Um, in Worcester, St Barnabas has a Celtic cross outside as their war memorial. Up in North Yorkshire, Great Ayton and Stairs are two examples. I could have put various other ones. It's not an uncommon design. But I'm sure you can think of far many other designs, some maybe with a soldier or, the, or various other types that, that people have chosen. The next question is, how do we raise the money for this? It was estimated to be about 150 to 200 pounds, about 4,000 pounds in today's money. And they, did, they set about forming a subcommittee to suggest options and how to go about. And the, and the indication you get is that they're quite used to raising money, maybe not on this scale, but um, of setting up subscription lists and people who'd go around the parish, knocking on doors, collecting regular contributions. Because people were saying that um, many, many across the parish would want to contribute. So various volunteers would, would started going around collecting money, um, either that or collecting pledges and £10 was spent on creating an engraving of what it would look, look like in a brochure that would be passed round. Um, so this is what the artist's impression of what uh, the War Memorial would look like uh, on the, and the position on the north side of the church and then the names would be engraved on it. A letter was sent to the mayor and uh, a version of it was included within the brochure. And they wrote to the mayor and to the general public for two reasons. Um, one is that they said All Saints is a poor parish. Um, the people of the parish are very keen to have a war memorial. However, mostly they can only afford a tiny amount and that will make it very difficult to create a war memorial. So outside help would be appreciated. The other reason is that on the war memorial would be the name of Fred Dancox, who won the Victoria Cross. And it was felt that it was important that there was a war memorial that had um, Frederick Dancox's name on in his parish. And so that they were keen that uh, for those reasons, that if possible, people wider than the parish of All Saints would contribute. And the, and the mayor did respond and he did contribute towards it. Um, so the, it got off to um, a good start, starting to raise money. And I said one of the ways that they were persuading people outside All Saints itself was that it was a way to honour the, the, the memory of Frederick's Dancox. Um, Fred Dancox was a Worcester man, baptised and born up in, in Clane um, and uh, near uh, St Stephen's Church. He, his uh, occupation before the war was given as a hair trusser and before joining up in 19, uh, 1915, he married um, Ellen. They had five children, the last of which was baptised in All Saints and they lived on, um, on Bull Entry, just by where um, HMV used to be and there is a plaque recording that just in Bull Entry. 
Um, he joined the Worcestershire Regiment and went over firstly to Gallipoli uh, before going to France. He won the Victoria Cross in, on the 9th of October 1917 during the Third Battle of Ypres or Passchendaele. It's described that the 4th Battalion was coming under heavy fire from German machine gun and was unable to advance. Dan Cox was one of 10 men appointed as moppers up, but he became separated from them from, during the course of the battle. It's described that Dan Cox went from shell hole to shell hole, approaching the rear of the German blockhouse, a concrete structure designed to protect the machine gunners. The 40 or so soldiers inside surrendered when Dan Cox threatened to throw a hand grenade inside. And then after taking the soldiers back to the British lines, he then returned uh, to help dismantle the machine gun. His actions, demonstrating what they said was the most conspicuous bravery and dedication to duty and attack, earned him the Victoria Cross. He was awarded uh, leave in which he could come home to England and receive the Victoria Cross from the King. And on the day that he was due to arrive home, uh, many went to the railway station. Various dignitaries joined um, his wife, Ellen, um, all ready to welcome him back. But he didn't get off. There is a story, I haven't, I haven't been able to confirm if it's true, that actually another man in soldier's uniform came off and those who didn't know Dan Cox assumed it was him and mobbed him and celebrated him and, uh, and said well done and uh, cheered. Somebody was obviously rather bemused at what was going on. In the days before mobile phones and email, it was easy for people not to know what was happening for a while and so nobody was quite sure what had happened and how long it had been before he returned. But rumours of his death started to emerge and then on the 22nd of December the Barrows Worcester Journal informed people that Dan Cox had died. It was described that he on the, th on the 30th of November uh, had been part of um, the battalion who'd been mobilised against a German counter-attack. Frederick Dancock sadly died uh, of a shrapnel wound to his head. His commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Senhouse Clark, wrote to Ellen Dancock's. I write these few lines to express to you the deepest sympathy as usual in your great loss. Needless to say, your husband is a very great icon to the regiment. No words of mine are necessary to remind you of his valour. The VC he so well earned speaks for itself. He was killed during a counter-attack we had, we had to make on th November the 30th, when the Germans attacked in force. He had been granted 14 days leave and would have left the battalion that night. But we were called upon to fight. And of course he was there and did his full share to the end. You may indeed feel proud. We are all proud of him. And his name will go down in history as one of the bravest of the brave. Yours very truly, B.O. Senhouse Clark, Lieutenant Colonel. Ellen Dancox then collected the Victoria Cross from the King on her husband's behalf. A fund was set up to support her and her family. Start, uh, the Mayor and the Town Clerk were amongst the trustees and the City Council pledged £50 to start it off. £451 were raised, um, around £15,000 in today's money, which was added to when the City Council purchased the Victoria Cross a number of years later, before passing it on to the Regimental Museum. In 1932, when the Prince of Wales, later Edward VIII, came to Worcester and laid a wreath at the war memorial outside the, the cathedral, it was Ellen Dancox who was chosen to present the prince with the wreath, showing that, she, uh, uh, that Frederick Dancox and herself had not been forgotten by the people of Worcester. One of the strange things is on the war memorial, he's actually down as Frank Dan Cox. 
I've tried to work out why this is. Was it that he was actually known as as, as Frank, despite um, being down on all the records as Frederick? Although I haven't been able to find any other reference to uh, to Frank elsewhere. Or was it that they got it wrong on the memorial, which you want to end isn't unknown, but considering that Dan Cox was so well known, he was a Victoria Cross winner, presumably there was friends and family there um, in, the, in the parish seeing it, um, you'd have thought that something might have been said or, and it would have been altered. So why it is that it's uh, Frank Dan Cox, we don't actually know. It's one of these little puzzles. By the 8th of June, the next uh, one of the next meetings was held and it was said that about £90 had been raised, including pledges. Many of this, many of the contributions were from small weekly subscriptions that people being able to for small amounts each week as they could afford. Another push was made, particularly Bridge Street and Broad Street, and it hinted at, or maybe a bit more than hinted, that it's felt that they the people there hadn't contributed as much as they could have done. These were the more wealthier people and it was felt they could have contributed more. Despite this, over the next six months, only another six pounds seems to have been raised. And in, and in December, the Reverend McCrae leaves for a church up in Scotland in St Andrews. There's then silence in the War Memorial Committee minutes until January 1922, just over a year later. The Reverend Philpot is now the vicar at All Saints. And Joseph Beachy, who is the secretary of the, of the War Memorial Committee, and he seems to be the, one of the main driving forces behind it. He writes to the Reverend Philpot to give him the background and say that they really need to meet again. Again, he, he says how um, they're disappointed with the responses of the people in Broad Street and Bridge Street who could have afforded more, uh, but they're so impressed by the poorer people who've contributed sacrificially towards the memorial. Very much it's lost momentum, maybe because the Reverend McCrae leaving, maybe for other reasons. So they, they managed to convene another meeting and again, this, it comes out how they've, they've lost momentum. They have £102, of which £90 is available to spend. And this is inadequate for, for what they're wanting. It won't cover the cost of the planned uh, Celtic cross outside the church. So they need to, to do something else. I was chatting to the people behind the uh, research into the Great Ayrton War Memorial, which I'd mentioned earlier, and I'd asked them about how they'd raised the money um, and how, whether they had, they'd had any problems. And they said, not as far as they, they knew. There was very little information about that, but they said there's nothing to indicate that. Um, in some places, they were paid for by a local dignitary, the local lord of the manor. Um, somebody, a rich resident, may have contributed the, the bulk of it. Um, at all sides, that doesn't seem to be the case. There doesn't seem to be anybody like that. And they probably also suffered, if that's the right word, from being part of a, a city where people would be contributing maybe to other war memorials as well. It was unanimous to invite everybody to another meeting a week later to discuss a wooden memorial instead, which they felt they could afford. And in there, there's an interesting letter from somebody in response to that. Uh, Mr. Burton, who says he couldn't attend the couldn't attend meeting because he was suffering with gastroenteritis. And he said that he agreed with a memorial being inside and thought that probably should have been there from the start. Um, if it was outside, it would be damaged by mischievous, mischievous youths as things are damaged at present. I myself am often chasing youths out to the grounds of the church, youths old enough to know better. I don't mean small boys and girls, and if such a memorial was erected, I'm certain it would get damaged by such ignorant youths. I can't understand how they are allowed to run and race around the church grounds like they do, so I'm afraid that the memorial being in the church, it's inside the church instead of outside, is the best solution. Wishing you a successful meet, meeting, yours, Mr. Burton. 
I find it quite interesting because people talk about about things like, oh, in the past this wouldn't have happened. Oh, people wouldn't have have done you know um, done any vandalism in a churchyard thing uh, things like that. Um, and then you read a, a letter like that, and you suddenly realise that things may not be quite as different than, than you know as we as we think. So on the 13th of February, 1922, the rector and 22 other people came and met and they agreed for a wooden memorial inside for the price of £100. In proud and grateful remembrance of the men from the parish and congregation of all saints who laid down their lives in the Great War, 1914 to 18, this memorial is erected. And so that was the memorial that was then produced um, and again you know once I you know you start looking you do see them elsewhere and it's not uncommon to, sometimes you have that as well as the ones outside St David's Cathedral that's their uh, one of their war memorials inside so a, a wooden memorial is not unusual now they had to go and get get the, the names who were they going to put on it was mentioned that there's about 200 names of men who'd served on the Royal of Honour during the war. Now, these are men who went off to fight, um, many of whom would have come back. Sadly, the Royal of Honour hasn't survived and very, very few have. Uh, most churches and many other places did compile worlds, worlds of honour during the war. How do you think about how do they create war morals? How do they put names? How do they decide? Um, for the All Saints one, they did probably what many others did. They put adverts in newspapers inviting people to contribute names. They asked around the congregation and other people. They spoke to the mayor and asked him whether he had lists which way they could help, um, help them find names of people in the All Saints parish who they could put on. And they also spoke to the former rector, the Reverend McRae. Uh, they wrote to him but to ask him who he could remember, who should be on there, and also to run names past him for who he could remember and checking that they were appropriate. Um, apologies, sadly, on your computer screen, it might not be as big as it could be. Um, but some of the names in later uh, documents are mentioned when they're going through and editing and trying to work out who to put on. As I said, they don't go in full details, but there are some where they've got a list of names and then there's comments. So there's Bert Brooks, says, recently supplied by a relative. Late rector does not know him. And then in brackets, sister lived in Dolde, and then it just said correct, and he's on the memorial. Uh, George James, this name is on the Royal of Honour. Neither the late rector nor Miss Walker, presumably the sort of person who uh, is the fount of all knowledge and uh, would know everybody. Um, they, uh, she has no knowledge of him. He's not included. Um, Christopher Verrill, the late rector, says he he, sorry, he thinks that um, he was a nephew of Sister Margaret, who let, a lieutenant in the Sussex Regiment. He's not on there. And it shows that how some people, even though there might be no, li no link to that particular area, might still want uh, a relative of theirs remembered on a war memorial where they might be living. So sometimes they might have to be strict. And then intriguingly, there's Frank Ashbourne. It says, the mother has stated that this son's home during the war was not Worcester, though his brother's, George Ashbourne, was. Frank does not appear to have to possess the necessary qualification. So one brother, George, is on the memorial, but Frank isn't. So you think there is a strange thing of how do they get it? You know, what is the criteria? There would be some who are missed off. Uh, and my father-in-law uh, was one of the people who got a, f a number of people added to the Dorchester War Memorial a few years ago. People may have moved away. It was a few years after the war and some people may have either moved away or not remembered or missed the, the advert and getting names on the list. Um, a couple of other names just to mention. Um, Aircraftsman Cyril Jones, member of the RAF. He died um, on the 9th of August 1919 in Shrewsbury. Um, on time off, he was based near Shrewsbury. Uh, he was swimming in the River Severn when sadly he got cramp and drowned. He was then, uh, his body was then brought back to Worcester 
where he was buried after us in St John Cemetery after a funeral service at All Saints. It was mentioned that, that he um, and his parents were choristers at All Saints, although they lived in Comer Road in St John's. Now, if you noted the, uh, the date that I mentioned, it was August 1919. This was almost a year after the end of the war and people a year or two after the end of the war, sometimes more, may still be included on the memorial, even if they didn't die connected to the war. We're not actually sure that Cyril actually ever went to the front. Um, he did join up um, about na um, towards the end of, um, of 1917, but we're not sure from his record whether he was only stationed in England or whether he did go out. And then there's Henry Giles, who I cannot find any reference to him at all. There's no clue in the committee minutes as to who he might be. So there's various sources that you can use to trace um, soldiers who, um, who, are, who are on war memorials, both this one and on others. Um, soldiers died in the Great War, um, a comp uh, which was compiled shortly after the end of the war. The Commonwealth War Graves Commission website, various records on the Ancestry website to medal rolls, things like that. The census from uh, 1901, 1911, newspapers, parish registers, regimental history, service records. And for Worcestershire, it's always worth checking the website rememberthefallen.co.uk, which contains details of almost all the war memorials in the county and of the men who are remembered on them. And so it, it is an amazing resource, which if you ever want to look into that, it's well worth looking at. So some of the other men, uh, soldiers who are mentioned, um, it's, just, it's just some examples. Uh, William Chance, who was a rifleman in the London Regiment. He worked for Royal Mail, and so he joined the post office rifles. Quite a few people would join up, you know, the PALS battalions, either the people who lived locally or connected by an occupation or, or some other interest. Um, possibly he was living in Birmingham when he joined up, but his parents lived on Bridge Street in Worcester, uh, just down the road from All Saints. Um, he died aged 24 in 1916 and as well as the All Saints Memorial and the uh, Worcester Memorial in, uh, in the Guildhall, he's also mentioned on the, uh, the post office memorial that used to be in Worcester Post Office and is now in the um, in the Royal Mail Centre in Warnden. So if you're ever going to collect a parcel from the sorting office, it is now located there and his name is mentioned on there. We also, um, one of the various sources um, that I, I, I found him on, for instance, the medal roll card, saying what, which of the medals he, he received. And most people, if you served, um, there's three main ones, the um, that people would, ha that would, would receive and so the details and sometimes you also have, d have addresses and other information about people on there. Um, one of the other people who are mentioned is Private William Bayliss who joined the Worcestershire Regiment, lived on um, Little Angel Street. Um, I said just round the corner from All Saints, just off the butts. And for him, we also have a bit of information from the newspaper. After he died, um, his photograph was in the Barrow's pictorial supplement and a short piece of information was included in the newspaper. Not everybody was included. It probably depended on whether relatives submitted a photograph and information. Um, the newspaper records that Mr. Bayliss, hairdresser in Little Angel Street, has received information that his son, William Bayliss, was killed in action. He enlisted just after the outbreak of war and was wounded in the Battle of Luz, after which he was home for a short break. He was 20 years of age and spent two birthdays in the trenches. Mr. Bailiff received a letter of sympathy from the chaplain of the Worcestershire Regiment, in which he says, It is greatest respect and sympathy that I have to inform you of the death 
in action of your son, which took place on the 5th of July, in the great battle. He was killed by a shell which exploded near him, while he was gallantly working a machine gun near him. Death was instantaneous, and he can have suffered no pain. I much regret that because of the conditions at the time, he had to be buried where he fell. If, however, it becomes possible later on to mark his grave, you may be sure that this will be done. His commanding officer, company officer and comrades all send you their entire sympathy. I know what a bitter blow this will be to you, but I pray it that God may give you strength to bear it, and that you may find comfort in the thought that your son died nobly for king and country. Many of the letters would have been similar uh, as they were sent back, uh, almost all saying how whoever uh, the person died, that they had died instantaneously and, and hadn't suffered to try and reassure the parents or wife. Sergeant Maund is also recorded on the memorial. He was already in the army. In 1911, he was based at Carisbrook Castle on the Isle of Wight in the garrison there. His is quite a strange one when I was researching him because there's another Arthur Maund, very similar age, who got married at All Saints Church a few years earlier, whereas this Arthur Maund seems, seemingly has no connection to All Saints Church, um, having lived uh, up in the Team Valley in Herefordshire um, and then his family in Lower Wick. But presumably there must have been some connection for him to be uh, included. We know from the regimental history that, that when he died um, on the 13th of October 1915, he was part of a battalion, uh, the, the battalion uh, bombers, the Grenadier platoon, who were sent to assist a major attack. It was an unsuccessful attack and that both of the leaders, Lieutenant Lester and Sergeant Maund, were killed. Some of the other surviving records are the um, Last Will and Testaments that are on the Ancestry website. Um, most of these just provide brief information, just mostly just saying that they pass on um, what the, uh, their uh, possessions to the next of kin, their wife or, or their parents. Probably this would have been filled in just before a major battle and then witnessed by an officer. This one is for George Jones. Um, he probably was already in the army because he, it says he entered the theatre of war on the 11th of September 1914. Most people who joined up at the start of the war, it took them several months to get to the front line. This is a photograph of him. He died in May 1916 age 41, dying of wounds, and is buried out in France. Son of Frederick, Frederick John and Matilda Elizabeth Jones of London, and husband of Annie Jones of One House, Two Court, Lich Street, Worcester. Lich Street is um, where Cathedral Square is today, and the court's um, I'll show you a picture of one of Newport Street. They were usually, as I said, crowded round a courtyard and not a particularly pleasant place to live, although some of the Lich Street ones look as if they might have been a bit more spacious. Um, the more War Memorial Committee minute says that he was on the Royal of Honour during the war, so he certainly had, seems to have had some connection during the war, uh, sorry, uh, maybe previously to the war. Um, Some of the other people, John Smith, who um, seems to be a bit strange because on one source he was born 1890, another one 1874, but in both cases that seems to be the same person. But uh, various sources, it can be hard to track down who these people are because some of the information doesn't always tally and it can be hard to work out who is who. Um, Private George Thomas Lee. Um, he lived certainly in the um, 1901 and 1911 census in the blockhouse, which was near uh, 
St. Paul's Church near St. Martin's Gate car park. Um, and his is a little bit strange because one source says that he died uh, and buried in Italy, the other one in France. And then we have Hubert Pulley, who I think is the only one of the men named on here who was in the Royal Navy. Um, he was already in the Navy. Um, he was a naval seaman, and some sources call him Herbert, and, the other, and others Hubert. And there were a few where you know, things were a little bit contradictory. Now, the armed forces are notorious for we call you what we call you. I mean, I, I forgot to say that Dan Cox um, is now spelt with an X at the end, but previous to the war, it was uh, CKS at the end, but the army called him something else. And if the army call you that, that is what you get called. He was born in 1891 and he joined up in 1909 um, at the age of 18 for 12 years. Uh, we have his naval record and it includes the fact that he's got a tattoo uh, or a couple uh, of a shamrock rose and thistle on the left arm and a tattoo for Elsie on the right. Now his wife was called Kathleen and his mother was not Elsie. So who is Elsie? Um, he was five foot two, had scar on, on the right side of his head. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, at 16 he was five foot two, and two years later he was five foot four. Dark brown hair, grey eyes, and a fresh com complexion. He died on the 26th of November. 1914 in, in, in an explosion of HMS Bulwark just off the Kent coast. 736 men died, with only 14 survivors, all of whom were badly wounded. It was never fully worked out why the ship sank. It was suspected, though, that it was the, well, the way that um, that the shells had been stored and that may have been a spark or something else had set them off. Almost certainly it wasn't anything to do with um, with enemy action. And it was one of the biggest losses of a, of, a, of a ship during the war. And there is a memorial uh, in which he is mentioned as well at Sheerness and Gillingham. So the memorial um, was created and the names after a period of time were added to the memorial they were agreed upon um, it was uh, the, the memorial was was designed and created by henry Vaux on uh, who worked for the architects he was a major uh, during the war in the worcestershire regiment his fee for this was three pounds three shillings and it's noted in the in the in the minutes that um, he waived his fee, he donated it back to the War Memorial Fund. Whether this was because, as a as a member of the Worcestershire Reg for member of the Worcestershire Regiment, he wanted to contribute, maybe he had local connections. Um, it doesn't say, but very kindly, he waived his fee. The memorial um, was unveiled on the twenty third of July, nineteen twenty two, by the Archdeacon of Dudley. The service took place and um, everybody who wanted to was invited. Um, as was said at the start, it was seen to be for everybody within the parish, whoever wanted to um, could come. Um, and there's a note in the minute saying about getting as many chairs as possible from other places so people could be congregated. Um, it was arranged that 20 to 24 members of the Worcestershire Regiment would come. Um, those who played the drums and bugles, who would play as part of the service and would also pay their respects on behalf of the army. Sadly, I can't find a reference of the actual service, only the advert in the weeks beforehand in which um, people were invited to come along uh, and pay their respects and uh, be part of uh, the service or of memorial for uh, the people of All Saints. And that is where um, almost the end of the of the story in 
the Second World War, several more names were added to the sides of the of the memorial. Um, unlike the First World War, there was only a handful of men, partly because not as many men died during the Second World War. And also, um, that's that part of, of Worcester had started to be depopulated. Several of the houses started to be pulled down. Um, and some of the churches, were, uh, parishes were, were combined. Even so, there's a handful were added. And then the war memorial was moved from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, where it still remains today. And, um, and where on Remembrance Sunday, um, quite often there will be a wreath laid in memory of those men. The fact that we know all this is down to Joseph Beachy, who was the, who was the church uh, secretary. And the window that is shown um, was restored after he died in his memory. Joseph Beachy seems to have been the driving force behind the memorial of making sure it happened. Various times it seems to seem to have kind of lose momentum, but he was um, encouraging everybody on um, and getting it organised. Um, and it is probably thanks to him that was one of the driving forces, but also the many other people who contributed, some of them uh, sacrificially from the little that they had to pay for the memorial and contribute it to, uh, towards it so that those men could be remembered. I'm not sure whether Joseph Beachy had served in the war and that was why he um, was so keen. He was in his late 30s during the war, so it was kind of on the cusp um, if there'd been conscription as to whether he would have been required to join up. Um, and beforehand, that was sort of the age when they weren't encouraging it quite so much. Or whether it was just that maybe he had relatives who'd served. Or, and, it, and it was probable that he would have known many of those men who were being recorded. As I said at the start, it is quite unusual for these minutes to survive. In most places, they haven't. And when I've mentioned it to people who have been researching the men on their own war memorial, um, they've sometimes gone off, gone off and looked and come back and said, we haven't got anything like that. Um, as I said, it's, um, it's just, it is just one example of numerous war memorials around the country. And so if you have a memorial local to you, just think, wonder, how might that have been created? Who who would have been behind it? Who would have been people driving it on and raising the money and making sure that those people were not forgotten? And so um, the, the memorial is there and if you ever go into All Saints, if you, as you look at the front, it's there on the right hand side where those men are, are named. Um, the research I've done and other people who have done it into those names have passed it on to Sandy Taylor, who has who does the Remember the Fallen website, so their names can be um, can be kept alive and the details of who they are that they are more than just names. So hopefully, um, if you if you you may be inspired to look into your own local war memorial. Lots of work has been done. So check out that website or check out many people have um, over the past few years with the centenary of the World War One have produced uh, booklets about the men who are remembered, bringing to life who they are, that they are real people. Sometimes photographs and details about who they are. Um, thank you for logging on and joining uh, this online talk. I hope you found it interesting and said and hopefully it may open your eyes uh, to when you see other memorials and thinking about those. Um, I said a lot of the information I did have compiled over a number of years um, in the Worcestershire Archive and Archaeology Service where I work and some of the records that we have and perhaps you may be inspired to do your own research. Um, thank you for joining us and uh, please look out for some of the other talks that we are planning on doing as we um, plan to pass on some of the information that we've got in some of our talks. Um, as we can't give out physical talks at the moment, you may be interested in, in logging on and hearing about some of the other information and the stories that we have uncovered from the archives and the archaeology that we look after. 
Thank you for joining us.